History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 400th episode, Kelly, Woohoo! of the History Goes Bump <laughs> podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. As I was saying, this is number 400. Can't believe that we've done 400 episodes of this podcast. You are very dedicated. <laughs> Of course, if you look at the podcast catcher that you happen to be listening in, it has a lot more than 400 episodes because we've had extras and such. But yeah, this is number 400. And we are doing a location that was suggested to us by the paranormal crew from the 502. And that is the Whispers Estate. And they're going to be joining us to talk about their experiences there. Lots of fun. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Michael, Amanda, Lauren, Scott, Tim, Carolyn, Ruth, and Heather. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Noddity. The moment in Oddity was suggested by Scott Booker. Pepe II Nefakari was pharaoh over Egypt in the 6th dynasty. He came to the throne at the age of 6, so his mother, Ankes and Mary II, served as regent. According to some historians, Pepe II was the longest-serving pharaoh of all, holding his position for 90 years. Others say that it was a misreading of numbers. Whatever the case, he served a long time with his reign serving as the decline of the Old Kingdom. Pharaohs would lose their dominant central power at this time. One reason pharaohs had been able to maintain so much authority was because a special ceremony was held for each, in which they were imbued with the spirit of Osiris, and thus the people considered the pharaoh to be a god. Pepi II's name was Nefakari, meaning beautiful is the Ka of Re, which literally means beautiful is the soul of the sun god. With a name like that and believing you were a god, it's not surprising that you would do some crazy things. Pepe II hated flies, so he was never without several naked servants around him, covered in honey, so that they would attract the flies away from him. And that certainly is odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. month of September on the 5th in 1975, President Gerald Ford survives an assassination attempt. President Ford was walking near the California State Capitol when he was approached by a little red-haired woman who was carrying a 45 caliber handgun. As she raised the gun, Secret Service agents tackled her and wrestled the gun from her hands. This woman was Lynette Fromm, but most people know her by her nickname, Squeaky. Yep, that Squeaky Fromm, who hung out with Charlie Manson and his family. She was so desperate to receive his approval that she hatched the assassination plot and tried to carry it out. Fromm was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to life in prison. She didn't serve for life, though. She was released in 2009. As for President Ford, he was unflappable and continued on to the Capitol where he spoke before the California legislature. Ironically, the subject of his speech was crime. The Whispers Estate is located in Mitchell, Indiana, and is thought to have been built in 1894 by Dr. George White and his wife, Sarah. The estate was then bought by Dr. John Gibbons and his wife, Jessie. Dr. Gibbons had his office in the house and ran that practice for 26 years. Many adults and children are thought to have died in the house, including the doctor's wife, Jessie. 
The house has so much activity, it's thought to be one of the most haunted locations in America and is open for ghost hunting. Its name comes from the fact that so many disembodied voices are heard whispering there. We're joined on this episode by members of the paranormal crew from the 502, Shannon, Eva, Stacy, and Dan, to share their experiences investigating the house. So let's meet the 502 crew. They introduce themselves and share about some haunting experiences they had that got them started on this path and how they go about investigating locations. Well, we are joined by the paranormal crew from the 502 out of Louisville, Kentucky. I thought we could start with you guys kind of going around and introducing yourselves so we know who all's there. Okay. My name is Shannon. I founded the group a few months ago. I'm the team leader. I'm I'm one of the coordinators that does a lot of the research and does the calling for the booking. And I joined the group right off the bat. I've been having a ball. And I'm Eva, and I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do some research. Uh, I did our website, and I set up the email and our uh, YouTube channel with the help of my daughter. So she's out of the country right now, so when she comes back, I'll update it. But <laughs> I'm Dan, junior investigator and walking, talking bait. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, since he's the only guy in our group right now, he gets to use his bait a lot. So bless his heart. Well, I was going to say, I'd heard that you were mostly women, so he must be your token male. Yes. yes. There's a girl in our group, Caitlin, and she couldn't make it tonight. And then we have a new girl that's going to be joining our group. Her name is Allie. So being that you're the paranormal crew from the 502, what does that mean? 502 is our area code here in Louisville. We tried to come up with something catchy that, you know, kind of rhymed or whatever. So that's how we just came up with that. I love that. Very cool. So you haven't been doing this very long. What made you guys decide to put together the group and start investigating places? This particular team has only been together since January and the others can speak for themselves of what they've done but I've been doing this a lot longer than that myself I just decided in January to create the team I've always been interested in it I mean I've watched paranormal shows mine as long as they've been on tv but I used to live in a haunted house and so I experienced and saw a lot of things that made me extremely curious about it to the point where I I really wanted to do uh, more research about it. And I wanted to see if I could get more evidence. Very cool. So you took your passion essentially and made it official. Yes. This is Stacy. I have just been interested. I've never, I've never been scared of anything uh, like paranormal type or watching, you know, scary shows. Everybody be like, oh my God, it's scary. And I'm like, that's nothing, you know. Uh, Right now, I live in a house that has some strange goings on. We have seen some things. I've seen actually a little girl. And so is my husband. And so is my daughter. And she's always has a white dress on with uh, blue polka dots on it. Nothing bad has happened. We have had just weird things going, like doors opening. Um, we've had shadows. My husband has been quite, he, he can't handle it. I mean, he just, he just, he's not very good with this kind of stuff. He just gets scared and he'll come down the hall and he'll say, uh, he'll look white ghost. My daughter ran and down the hall and jumped in the bed with me and she's like, I feed her, I feed her, you know, and. It's just some things. I actually got some um, ashes in my house. I don't, and, but it was before that that it even. I've got my mother and father-in-law and my father in the house with me that has passed away. I've had a lot of people that have seen things that go on in my house, and have seen things. You know, my daughter used to have friends in the night all the time, and you know they always 
call our house the spooky house because they've seen things go on. But other than that, I've just I've just always been interested in stuff like this. It's kind of like a thrill for me to learn new things. So that's what got me into it. Very cool. Now, have you done any research on your house just to perhaps find out who the little girl may be? I have actually asked the owner of the house, and she said nothing. <laughs> she actually lived in it because uh, I rent the house, and um, she said nothing ever has happened in it or anything. So I don't know what could be the deal, but I do know the next door neighbor has actually seen the same thing in their house. So I don't know if it's even if it, it happens, if it jumps from one house to the other and it actually is coming from the other house or, but it seems like it's happened more at our house than theirs. This is Eva and I don't have exciting stories like they do, but when I was a young child, I was always uh, interested in cryptids is what they call them now, the big foots and all those. And I was wondering, you know, is that true? And then as I got older, I got intrigued with, um, all the paranormal on TV and always wanting to know, is it for real? So I always wondered, you know, hmm, is that real? When Shannon was putting out there that she was going to get this group together, I was like, me, pick me. <laughs> I want to go. And I learned, yes, that there is something beyond what uh, we can see in this realm of existence. So I'm having a blast and I love it. This is Dan. I grew up in Illinois uh, from about the ages of 5 to 10. Uh, we lived in a, an old farmhouse that was built in the mid-1800s, and it just had things going on in it, like footsteps, uh, whispers from rooms that were unoccupied. I saw a phantasm of sorts once. Uh, there was a lot of feelings of being watched and had some sensitive people come over who wouldn't go in the house claiming that there was something in there that didn't want that in. So, you know, growing up with that, it just kind of stuck with me. And I kind of looked into it further as a kid, you know, checking out books at the library and whatnot. And it just carried on over into adulthood. Sounds like we all grew up very similarly. We liked ghosts as a kid and weird things, and we just kept doing it into our adulthood. (laughs) Sounds like you guys also do a lot of investigating similar in the way that Kelly and I do. When we go into a place, we're always very respectful. We introduce ourselves. We don't instigate anything with them. Tell us a little bit about how you guys go about investigating. First of all, we never provoke or we never try to irritate the spirits in any way. We come at it, like you said, in a very respectful manner. We go into it more so, you know, Eva and Stacy and Dan and everybody will, everybody does some research, obviously, before we go to try to see what we're, you know, what we may be dealing with there. But we come in there with respect and talk to them respectfully, like we would talk to, like we're talking to you, introduce ourselves and let them know, hey, we, we're just here, you know, we, we don't mean any disrespect. We're most definitely not trying to get rid of you or anything like that. We're just trying to learn more about what is on the other side. And we approach it that way. We make sure that we're completely respectful the entire time. We don't just immediately jump to conclusions about things. We do try to debunk if we can, at least least attempt to, or even had a situation at Whispers, which is what we were going to talk about too, where, you know, we, we captured a picture. Dan took a picture of the front of the house just to have a picture of the front of the house. And as we zoomed in on it, or as Dan zoomed in on it, he noticed a face of a little boy on the porch. And so we went outside and took more pictures and the face didn't show up. We went to the area where the face showed up in the picture and we tried to look at like the, you know, what the house was made, the materials and or the, the chairs or anything that was around it to try to see, is there anything that could have maybe looked like this little boy's face or anything like that? And that particular case, we were, we were not able to debunk it. We could not find any reason whatsoever. There was absolutely nothing there that looked even remotely close to a little boy's face. So 
that's how we approach it. You know, we're not like some of those people on the TV shows that want to go in and instigate everything and want to get scratched and want to get attacked and want things to follow them home. And we cleanse ourselves before we go in and cleanse ourselves when we come out. We always go in and, and say that we want to learn their story. Because if anything is there, you know, what is your story? Why are you here? And we always, like Shannon said, always come in with a great deal of respect and the more, even though we're a young group, the more that we've investigated, we know that every place that we've been to, that's what they want you to do. They want you to come into their place that they have and they take care of with respect and reverence. So we even have a mission statement that's on our website that says that was what we do. Uh, we approach every investigation with reverence and respect for not only the spirits that might be there, but for the property itself, for the owners of the property, for the caretakers of the property. And that's how we approach every investigation. We ask them about their favorite piece of equipment, and in telling us the answer, we hear about the Gates of Hell Cemetery. Do you guys have a favorite piece of equipment that you like to use? What's your all favorite? I like the flashlight. Dan doesn't like those, but I do. (laughs) I do too. We've had a lot of luck with flashlights and getting them to turn them on and off on command or in response to questions. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Shannon and I were actually at there's a cemetery in uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. It's called, well, it's termed or nicknamed uh, Gates Hill, Gates Hell, right? Cemetery. Gates, right? Gates of Hell. Gates of Hell Cemetery. But I believe it's a uh, property, Casey's Cemetery. We had a heck of a time finding it, and um, it is off the beaten path and then some. I think it must be a private cemetery. It was pretty well overgrown, and a lot of the uh, headstones and that were knocked over, and it's rumored they satanic worship thing goes on there, and we actually found some mirrors propped up against a tree that were broken. And we did a little bit of spirit box, spirit box, and we got some things, but in that particular day, there were storms moving in. And I said, well, why don't we break out the flashlights and just give it a go, right? Because we have to leave soon. And we propped them up on one of the headstones and we're sitting down on the ground. We got a little bit of a response. And then um, we were asking questions. Shane was asking a lot of questions. We weren't getting anything. And so I said, well, you know, we have to go. I said, the storm's moving in and we've got to go. So can you please turn the flashlight on one more time for us before we go? And no sooner did I get those words out of my mouth that the flashlight turned on and we were like ecstatic. So we were like, thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate that. And then it just turned off and there's no high winds. There's and no one around. We didn't touch them. Nothing's near them. And that was a really, for me anyway, was a really cool moment. It was just a really phenomenal moment for me. I also really like a talking EVP device just because a spirit box sometimes can be a little hard to interpret what they're saying. But the talking EVP is very, very clear with the words that it comes across. It speaks it and it spells it at the bottom. So even if you didn't quite understand what they're saying, it's spelled right out there at the bottom what what word they're coming across with. So I'd say that's our favorite. That sounds very handy because usually I'm listening back to EVP and half the time you get a class B or a class C and you're like, what was that? What did it say? It'd be so nice if they would just spell it out. Right. We asked about places they have investigated. It's hard to understand some of this, but the first place mentioned is Bardstown, Kentucky, and the Old Talbot Tavern there. So I know we're going to be talking about Whispers, but you guys have been to other places. What other places have you uh, visited? Well, we started our first investigation with Bardstown, Kentucky. Beautiful, beautiful town. Uh, We did the Old Jailers Inn bed and breakfast, and then we went to, well, I wasn't able to go, but Stacey and Shannon went to Talbot Tavern the next day. So that was our first investigation that we did. We've done some private residences. We did the Ross Opera House in Cynthiana, Kentucky. I've done overnight investigations at Waverly Waverly Hills about five or six times. 
Nice. And I've gotten amazing evidence every single time. That place has never let me down. I've never left there empty handed. Uh, we went to Perryville Battlefield and investigated that place and actually heard battle drums off in the distance. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Kelly, close your eyes for just a minute and get ready to have your mouth water. Okay. Mamma Mia mozzarella meatloafs, Caesar crunch chicken, brown sugar bourbon chicken salad, Middle Eastern steak and rice pilaf, Baja fish tacos, salmon in a creamy Dijon chive sauce, crispy Parmesan chicken, and firecracker meatballs. Oh my gosh, I'm so hungry now. Did you just hear my stomach growl? It literally (laughs) was growling. (laughs) Those are just a few of the meals that we have had thanks to HelloFresh. They have made making dinner so much easier for us. Not only have we gotten more creative with our cooking, but we don't have to decide what we're going to have for dinner every night. It's fantastic. It's so quick and the ingredients are so fresh. The fall harvest is officially on with HelloFresh. Count on seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls and Thanksgiving ready sides, as well as fresh, high quality ingredients that travel from the farm to your front door in less than a week. They have family friendly menus that are great for the back to school season. You can get started with HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash bump14 and use code bump14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash bump14 and use code bump14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. You'll be glad you did. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Kelly, I really think we need to do an episode on Bardstown. You know I'm available for it. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like there's a lot of haunted places there. And you know what's interesting is I'd never heard of this location before, but Jerry from Hillbilly Horror Stories has a group that they always get together and do some kind of a party or something at the Old Talbot Tavern in Bardstown. And he was telling me about it the other day. And I'm like, that just came up on our podcast. <laughs> it's pretty synchronistic. Yeah. Then we started unwrapping the Whispers Estate. All right. Well, Whispers Estate, this is in Mitchell, Indiana. I've heard a lot of stuff about it. As in, not just the most haunted place in Indiana, but possibly one of the most haunted places in America. So, mm-hmm. do you know anything about the history of this place? There is actually a doctor that used to uh, do practice years and years ago. On it. it was, I think, in 1899. There was a Dr. John and Jesse Gibbons that purchased the house. They were the owners. Uh, Dr. George and Sarah White uh, were the original owners. Gibbons actually adopted abandoned and orphaned children. There was quite a few kids that was in there. There was a 10-year-old girl named Rachel. She actually got burnt real bad, uh, was playing around with some candles around at Christmas time and caught on fire. And she actually passed away a few days later up in the stairs. Uh, there was actually the doctor years ago practiced his business in there in the house and there is a room back there that was actually there's several rooms that can kind of go off like you're going to different rooms one of them was the waiting room and then when you went into the bedroom that was actually where they actually seen the patient and then when you walked in in the bathroom now when you was outside of the room that used to be the patient room that that was kind of like the operating room So it kind of all did all the business in there. The history also had of the house, it used to be they used to rent it out as apartments, the rooms upstairs. Each room was rented out. Yeah. There was actually a music teacher that she passed away in there in 1955. The husband wonder brought back to there, so they brought her back. The little boy, uh, there was a little boy, which recently uh, we just found out his name was Gary by Rich. Rich is the owner now, Rich Ballard, and we actually became good friends with him since we went and investigated. We kind of talked to him, and matter of fact, he's going to go on next week to the Oxford house with us to investigate that. He actually told me something really cool about that. One of the kids that uh, passed away, 
Now, I'm not too sure. I'm kind of confused about this, so I don't want you to hold me to this, but there was a 10-year-old boy. Now, I'm thinking that is Gary. He told us his name was Gary. Now, we don't, we're not quite sure, and I'm going to ask Rich about that when I talk to him again. I don't know if Gary was actually the little uh, kid that was in the room. There's like a little room inside. Well, the, I think it's in the 1980s is the only other time that it was truly owned by someone other than the 1800s. And in the 1980s, I think early 80s, the family lived there and they had a child who uh, we believe, at least uh, Rich told us, that he was autistic. That he fell down the stairs at some point and passed away. We believe that that's the little boy's face that Dan was able to capture in the photograph that he took of the front porch. That's what we think. What we'd like to do, I don't know exactly how we're going to do this, but we'd really like to have a picture of Gary so that we can kind of compare the two images and to see how well they match each other. I think that the little boy had a special attachment to Dan when we were there. He being the only guy in our group, (laughs) I guess he felt more of a bond with him. Well, I talked to Rich about the little boy some because we were getting his name wrong, and he let me know the name, uh, which is kind of interesting. He told me years ago that he seen some people outside standing and looking at the house, and he asked them, can he help them? And one of the ladies was actually the little boy's sister. So she was coming back to look at the house and kind of just reminisce about, you know, her her uh, brother passing away in there. And he actually asked the lady for a picture of uh, the little boy. So he would have it. And he kept thinking that she was going to send it. And she didn't send it. He's going to try to get a picture on it and let us know if that is actually, that way we could compare it to Dan's picture that he took. But Dan was in there in the room, and Dan, tell us how you felt when we were in there. Well, Rich was giving us a tour around the house, and he took us up into one of the bedrooms, and we were just all kind of standing in a circle listening to Rich. And at one point, it just felt like there was somebody behind me. That feeling like somebody was looking at you or standing close to you, something like that. And I just kind of turned around and, you know, observed my surroundings. And that was when Rich said that the direction I was going in was a closet that Gary used as a toy room. And my fellow investigators seem to think that there's a connection because my son is autistic. And they thought maybe that there might have been some sort of uh, bond there. Yeah, definitely maybe. Yeah, I, I really believe that. Yeah, because he, he said he felt like his hair was standing up on his neck and he turned around. And that was before Rich even told us that uh, that room was special to Gary. Yeah. And, you know, and Dan already, the door was not open or anything. He didn't even know that closet. It's kind of, when he says closet, it was like a little room. It's not like a little closet, like you hang your clothes up. It was kind of like a room. So Dan felt that before Rich even told us about it. And then when he opened it up, Dan went in there and kind of just kind of, you could tell Dan was drawn to that room, Yeah. you know, and, he then had the feelings before the door was even brought up, uh, opened up, even before Rich told us the history of it. So it was kind of neat. So I wanted to stop there, Kelly, because this is fascinating to me that Dan was drawn to a place that was special to this child's spirit that is believed to be autistic. And that's Gary is what they're calling the child ghost. And Dan has a child who is also autistic. So I don't know. I was just wondering about that. It seems to me like there's something happening on a different level here. How did that spirit know that there was this kind of kinship? And it's kind of like when we were talking to Cedric, who joined us a couple episodes ago, and he revealed that that spirit comforted him on the Gettysburg battlefield when he was having a PTSD moment. Yeah, it's very intriguing to me, just wondering how they they have this inner knowing Mm -hmm. or understanding, because it certainly seems to correlate often. Yeah, I certainly don't believe that spirits can read minds, but it's like somehow they just know. So how do they know? We'll continue on with more of the interview here. So you've got what sounds like a couple of children in here. And then 
have we had some adults who died in the house? Yeah, Jesse was a wife of the one of the doctors, I believe, and she had caught pneumonia and she died like five days later or something from the pneumonia and everything. Um, there was a guy that actually slipped and fell in the bathtub. Nobody found him for like three days that was in there. And Dan actually was kind of funny because Dan said, I'm going to slay in this bathtub. And this bathtub, Dan's a big guy. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. So Dan just himself up in the room in the dark and laid in the bathtub waiting for <laughs> something to happen. Yeah. It was kind of neat. There was a lot more children. There was a baby that died in there mm-hmm. too, and they said that there's like a smell of a lot of people that that actually rented the apartments and the bed and breakfast uh, rooms actually smell baby powder a lot. So I think that. That's got a lot to do with all the kids. I think there was quite a bit of more kids that was in there, too, I think, because of the uh, doctor and his wife adopting them. Something that kind of struck me in the 1800s, I believe it's Dr. Gibson, right? Yeah. That he was, uh, you know, a very well-respected doctor. But back then, doctors weren't plentiful like they are today. So he had to not only see patients who had common colds or things like that, but he had to perform surgeries. So a lot of these patients would die, not because of any kind of malicious intent on the doctor's part, but due to the fact of the rudimentary medical supplies that they had at that time, and he's the only doctor, and they didn't really have a choice. They could go to him or they could travel a far distance and try to get to someone which wasn't beneficial for them. But it just struck me because when Rich was taking us around and said, oh, this is operating room. And I'm thinking operating room. But he was the only doctor, so he had to do everything. So I think that there were some probably deaths that occurred during some operations that the doctor performed. I've heard or I think I read somewhere that they thought it was possible that there was a cemetery on the property. Do you know if that's true? Rich says he thought he thought that. They don't know for a fact. Actually, we were outside. We don't know what we kind of went out there and Dan was out there. And it was kind of weird because I was actually the closest one to Dan. And Dan, we don't know if this is actually what happened, but Dan did end up getting a scratch on his neck. And now we don't know if he, he can't remember if he scratched himself. I didn't see him scratching, but I was the closest to him. But I don't know. He might have scratched himself when I didn't know. But I did take a picture of the scratch, and it looked like the scratches that some of the pictures that Rich had of the scratches that people were scratched. Now, like I said, I, Dan don't know, and I don't know if he scratched himself, but I didn't see him do it, and he can't remember if he did it or not. So it's kind of eerie. You know. And Rich wasn't positive that so about crazy. about the cemetery. There are no headstones or anything like that. He did point to us in the backyard where it is said that the graves are. So he, he pointed us in that direction. And we did try some experiments out there to see if we could get some communication or whatever. And we weren't able to get anything outside. So it, it, uh, that's not a nobody knows for sure. However, Rich did say he had a friend who was going to come with ground penetrating radar and see if they could find any evidence of graves and ultimately dispel whether or not there is a cemetery on the property. I was yeah, just and in the, in the research on the, on on uh, Rich's research, it says supposedly it's supposed to be four graves out there, but nobody knows for sure. I was just going to ask if anyone had been around the area with ground penetrating radar. So, and that's probably one of our questions to him when we go when we go back. We kind of know each one of us got probably something to ask him because we've been there before and we kind of know now exactly what to look for. So, I think it's going to be kind of interesting, even if the spirits even know will recognize us from being there before, which right. would be kind of neat and. The kind of unique thing is because the house is so old, a lot of it doesn't even have electricity yet. There's electricity on the first floor, but Rich gave us tiny little flashlights 
to find our way around because there are no lights upstairs or in the attic. I think most of us, I know I was, when we started going through the old house, uh, it had a kind of a creepy feeling. It was kind of odd. And then as we went in the basement, which we've got a lot of spots in the basement, we were down there. But as we went through the house, then towards the end of the evening, early morning, we were sitting there and Dan made the mention of, it just kind of feels like home now. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> it just felt comfortable. It did. It was a comfortable feeling there. She had mentioned a lot of response down in the basement. Um, there was supposedly at one time brothers that got in a fight down down in the basement. And one of them actually hit the other in the back with an axe. And it recently they, uh, they had found that axe down there. So that's kind of neat. Depending upon what you think about him hitting him with that axe. Maybe. <laughs> that kind of and neat. another thing that happened, Rich sent me a picture and I put it on our, our little group text. The night after we investigated, there was a mirror downstairs and we were standing, actually Shannon was standing right beside it, talking to the spirits and getting the flashlights going and the EVPs and all that kind of stuff going on. But that mirror she stood beside the whole time. For some reason, I was drawn to that. I kept looking at that mirror. I don't know, because I thought, well, you know, because if it was shiny and everything. I, don't I think I was more worried about, because Shannon was so focused and didn't think. I was afraid she was going to walk into that mirror, because it's just kind of sat in the corner and everything. But what was really cool is Rich texted me the next night. There was another investigation there from another group. And he showed me in that mirror where I kept looking at and worried about Shannon going to walk into the mirror because she was so close to it. There was a picture of a, it looked like of a lady in the pit, in the mirror that he sent that somebody from the next night got that picture of. It was just like somebody was in the mirror. And Rich told us that that mirror, they do consider it a portal. Wow, very cool. Yeah, it was really neat. Shannon, we actually did a lot of EVPs and that type of recordings, and we didn't catch too much on there. But then Shannon uh, was in contact with someone who, I guess, either does investigations or somehow is tied in with Whisper States, and Shannon, didn't she pull out some... She must have some audio-enhancing equipment. There were a few things when we did... We did an EVP session in the Oculus room that they have there. We did capture, like we did hear with our own ears once we played the EVP back, we, we did hear a humming sound and we heard kind of like a sigh or whatever. But uh, this lady got in contact with me and apparently she took our EVP recording and she she must have put them in some in audio enhancing software because she sent me a long list of uh, with timestamps on it. And she was like, at two minutes and 19 seconds in, she's like, I know you didn't hear it because you all didn't say anything about it. But at two minutes and 19 seconds in, if you listen, you can hear her humming. And at 13 minutes and 15 seconds in, if you listen, you can hear a lady say this and that and whatever. And she had multiple things that she heard that we did not hear at the time. Whenever mm-hmm. we start one of our investigations, we do a Facebook Live kind of introduction about the place and where we're at and uh, kind of update you know, on Facebook Live throughout the evening. Shannon was saying that the individual, when we were doing that on the porch of Whisper Estates, that she caught through the enhancements voices or someone saying they're here. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. She did. She said she heard on the video itself that we did that she enhanced it and she heard a spirit voice come through and go there here. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. This Oculus room sounds intriguing to me. Can you describe what is this? Why does it have that name? One thing is this Oculus room is, it's basically a room that is nothing but mirrors. The floor is mirror or mirrors. The ceiling are mirrors. All of the walls are mirrors. Even the door is mirrors. So you're in a room of nothing but mirrors. And according to Rich, it's a really good place to catch EVPs, which is where we did get our EVPs from when we were there. He did tell us that Whispers Estates is the only place in 
America, North America, or yeah, yeah, it, the only the only place in North America that has an Oculus room. So it was really cool to investigate that. So how many times have you investigated at this location? Once so far, but we have another one booked for Labor Day weekend. We're going, we're going back. It sounds like a lot of people get scratched at this location. And as we know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the spirits are mean and trying to hurt people. Sometimes they're just trying to get attention. But have you heard stories of people having more violent type things happening to them, like getting pushed or hearing EVPs telling them? Somebody got pushed down the steps. and Supposedly. uh, Supposedly, somebody got pushed down the steps. So one of Rich's rules there is if you come in, you, you need to be wearing some tennis shoes. You know, they you don't want people with sandals on or flip flops or any kind of loose shoes. That way, you know, they could catch themselves if, if that really did happen. It was supposedly be pushed, you know, but down the stairs. I think Shannon had something happen to her. Yeah, when we first got there and Rich was doing a tour, he... he was showing us around and he was like if you all need to use the bathroom we've got this one upstairs but (laughs) you know we've got another one downstairs I recommend you use the one downstairs and so I said well why is that and he said that the the bathroom that's upstairs which is the one where they found the the guy that died and lay there for three days in the tub before he was discovered the same tub that that Dan laid there in, in complete darkness for a while for things to happen he said, if you're a female, I don't recommend you use this restroom. And I was like, well, why? And he said, because it's been reported many, many times that anytime a woman goes in and uses this restroom, she will get groped. Me being curious, I said, well, when I have to use the bathroom, that's exactly where I'm going because I need to experience this for myself. Not that I want to get groped by any means, but, you know, I want to see, is this real? Does this really happen and stuff? And and so I also spent some time in there by myself and I, you know, with all the lights out and I laid there in the tub for a long time and eventually I did get groped. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you know, I think you've, got to, you've got to be a unique person to go into yeah. the bathroom specifically I mean, where people you know, get groped and want it to get happen. Get somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did volunteer to get into a jail shower that with the SLS camera. That is true. We caught Kelly in a shower in a jail, and we had the SLS camera up, and she was joined by two figures, and they all seemed to be having a good time in there. Oh, yeah, it was quite if interesting. If it was a jail, I'm sure they loved her being in the shower. <laughs> I mean, bathrooms are a good place for that kind of stuff. I wanted to go back to what you were talking about. Like, he asked people... To wear tennis shoes. I don't know if you've watched any of the new Ghost Hunters, but uh, Kristen is one of their lead investigators on there. And we're always laughing about the fact that she's got these heeled boots on. And like, you know, she was climbing the St. Augustine lighthouse and those things. And then they were at some, I think it was a music camp or something. And I think she fell down the stairs, but she acted like a ghost had pushed her. And it just totally made me think of that. The person who claimed that they were pushed down the steps there... He's like, uh, it's too easy for people to fall. And these old houses like this, the stairs, like, they're kind of steady. They're very steep. They're narrow. And I think it's just a safety precaution uh, that he likes to take for that purpose, which is good. So we wear our tennies. Yeah. I have to go back to the, the shoe situation because any of our listeners know, <laughs> boots aside, if I were to be falling somewhere... I wouldn't be able to blame a ghost because I'm just clumsy that way. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I would try. I, I would try to blame the ghost. Wear any flat, or like tennis shoes to any of these places anyway, because who wants to investigate with heels on or absolutely you know, not. with flip flops that's going to be especially as yeah. long as you're going to be there. Yeah, I mean, it's just you want to be comfortable when you do this. If something did happen, you're and you know somebody got spooked or something they're going to push to get out of there and if you're in not in the right equipment or clothing then you could get hurt Mm -hmm. so you don't want to go there with any intentions and not being comfortable or that you can get hurt in is the whispers estate just open for hunts or can people stay overnight there how how does it function they've got a time that you can start and end now i do know he has some events coming up 
and you can watch where he, you can get on his website. He's going to be doing couples uh, dinner and then like the couples, I think this is around Christmas time. And you can actually uh, stay overnight to the, uh, to do the investigating that. I don't know too do much about it because he's just now in the process of, uh, he was just mentioning it to me in the process of uh, getting this going, but I think he's going to put that on his website and he has quite a few. He said he's got a, quite a few events coming up, but you could go on his, on the internet and book this. And it, he has the dates that's available and everything. And he, the house, he's real good at the tours. The house is really huge. It is, at least I thought it was like a labyrinth of going it was, through yeah. uh, stairways and there's an attic and then there's a little room over here and then there's an Oculus room and then you go down through the kitchen and then you go down in the basement and the upper level, it's not the attic, is it, where the servant steps go down. So there's another... That's the set, second floor. Second then, floor? Yeah. yeah the second that's floor, down there's... Rachel. Um, a set of steps, but he said it blocked off, and that was the servants' quarters. So the servants would have gone down there to prepare food or whatever for the family and that. But he's got that blocked off. So it is a very complicated, I would think, kind of house to maneuver around. Yeah, we were there for several hours, and we had absolutely no problem filling up our time because there are so many rooms there to investigate. Are there any experiences that you had there that you haven't shared yet that you wanted to let us know about? Well, we did go into Rachel's room, the one that the little girl who burned and then eventually died there in the house. Uh, We did go into her room and we brought the Boo Buddy bear in there because we thought she would like that. Set up a REM pod, set up some flashlights and such like, and just started talking to her or whatever. And I don't think that Boo Buddy ever shut up. (laughs) She must have loved it because it didn't go off pretty much the whole time. All the time. time. And then the REM pod would go off too. So it it was extremely active in that room for sure. He had some beach balls sitting on the the ends of the bed, like on the post or thing. And sometimes it didn't happen when we were there, but he said that sometimes that somebody, something pushes it off. And there's no wind or anything in there. There's, I mean, this these rooms are like, they're kind of like musky. It's it, like an old house is. I was just like, push it off, push it off, push it off. And I've done that. I, I was asking. Yeah, we want to play. Yeah, we were going to try it off. But yeah. she wouldn't. So it was pretty cool. But it's like, I, I would have just, that would have made my night. But it didn't happen. I'm more focused when I go there. I really like that room. That was one of my favorite rooms. And that's my I, I guess because I'm a grandma, I just, I'm really like little kids. So I kind of connected with her and I'm more focused on when we go back, I really want to see if she will communicate with us because I think her and Gary is going to be the most we're going to get because of Dan because he kind of was drawn to him and I'm drawn to Rachel. And they may recognize us. Yeah. Right. But when we went down into the basement, uh, I know Eva briefly told you that we went down in the basement and, and got a ton of stuff down there. But we set up an EVP and this and that. Of course, we didn't capture any EVPs, but we also set up flashlight in there. And, oh, we had our uh, K2 meter there. K2 meter was going off like crazy the majority of the time that we were down there. And then on top of that, the I think that's probably in all of our investigations, the most times we've had our flashlights go all on and off on command or in answer to a question that we had. We yeah, video, both yeah, of both them. of them. And we'd ask them, uh, you know, I had two of them sitting up there and it would prefer the left one, you know, forever. And then we'd say, hey, well, can you turn the right one on too? And then the right one would come on. It was extremely, extremely active down there. Well, this sounds like a fantastic place. We want to thank you guys for joining us to share about it. Where can people find out more about your group? We have a Facebook page, which is Paranormal uh, Brew from the 502. Yeah. <laughs> and then we also have a web page, and it is paranormal502.com. And you can go see upcoming events. All of us are on there. i got to put Dan on there. I have a picture of Dan. 
Oh, and we do have a little dog, and she's my little dog, that we hope to take on more investigations. We did take her to the uh, Hopeless Park Ridge in Louisville. Dogs are animals, and children are real sensitive to things. So you can learn about her, you can learn about the CDC, Shannon, and myself, and really? see some videos and some pictures from our investigations <coughs> on our website. Don't forget oh, and, and your YouTube channel. Oh, yes. And we have a YouTube channel. And we have my little Lily. She's on there on one of the things, too, mm-hmm. which is my little granddaughter. She's four years old and is very, very interested in the paranormal. <laughs> so she does. She don't actually go on any of, like, the whispers or octagon or anything, but she she has went to a couple of private home investigations and is just so thrilled about it. Well, you know, starting them young is a good idea, and uh, we've been shocked by how many young listeners we have to our podcast. We didn't think we'd have kids listening, and we've gotten down to, I think our youngest has been four or three, something like that. I believe it was a three-year-old, yeah. Every weekend when I get her, she'll say, turn on Bobby Mackey's. I want to watch Bobby Mackey's. You know, that's the first thing I, I had her last weekend. I said, you know, we had to turn it on. And her brother, who is 11, he's like, can't we watch something else? No, we're watching the ghost stuff. <laughs> so, too funny. <laughs> too cute. All right. You guys have a good night and uh, have a lot of fun with your future investigations. I'm so jealous you guys are booked all weekends. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, that was a really great interview. We want to share some other haunting experiences that we've heard about this location, because just based on their experiences, this place seems to be crazy haunted. And then there's lots of people who have investigated there that have had experiences. Jarrett Marshall had owned the house in 2007, and he was interviewed by WTHR News about the hauntings. Marshall thinks that his renovating of the house into a bed and breakfast stirred things up. He said, The house really is two houses. In the daytime, it's just a beautiful house, and in the nighttime, it wakes up, kind of. I heard footsteps on the stairs, and we've actually heard her, Rachel, sing Ring Around the Rosie in the middle of the night. That would be a little creepy to hear that. I agree. There was a couple in here that woke up in the middle of the night, and there was something standing by their bed. Things standing in the doorways doors open and close, things tap on the walls, and move the bed. We've had two people that actually left in the middle of the night because it was just too much for them. I think she's definitely still here. You actually hear a child singing. We all were sitting downstairs one night and we heard, Mommy. Mommy, ring around the (laughs) road. Creepy. There is a video up on the Whispers Estate website that features some interesting evidence caught using the phone app Spiritus. I've never heard of this app before, but it seemed to work kind of well for them. They caught some interesting EVP and words with the app. Seemed to be talking to a male who was trapped by something evil. And I do have a link so that people can watch that video up in the show notes if you want to. The investigators' names were Eric and Laura. Eric handed the phone to Laura and she asked if the spirit could tell them his name. It said, I can. Eric asked if the spirit knew Laura's name and it said, Duncan which is apparently her last name. And she was pretty freaked out by that. That would have creeped us out a bit because she hadn't said her full name. Kelly, you and I have discussed these phone apps, listen, so they could just be repeating back words that they've heard you saying. Right. That, that always kind of gives me pause because you do have to give permission for the microphone to be used. Exactly. And the only thing that makes me believe this a little bit is it was his phone. If she was using her phone, well, your name is on your phone at some point. I'm sure you're saying your last name. This is true. but so And she seemed pretty shocked by it. So, I don't know. Supposedly, the last name of the man who died in the bathtub was Henderson, and that name came across the app as well. They turned off the light, and it said, the light stopped working. (laughs) So, if for nothing else, even if it's repeating back things that it's heard before, it was coinciding with the questions being asked. So, it was just very interesting. Sure. These sound like some folks we would enjoy doing a ghost hunt with. And the Whispers Estate sounds like an interesting place, especially that Oculus room. Yeah, that that sounded pretty creepy to me. Is the Whispers Estate haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, if we ever make it up that way, definitely want to check that out. And it seems pretty affordable to get it for the night, to book it for the night. So definitely something we could pull off and have some listeners join us for. Even better. Let's go. 
We'd love to have you join us over on our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. It's that time of the year again, Kelly. Virtual trick or treat. I'm so excited. You need to join us over in the Spooktacular crew on Facebook. Wes Hawkins is our host this year for the virtual trick or treat. We thank him so much for that headache that he is taking on. Our ghost host. Yes, indeed. He's one of our moderators over there as well. It's got all the information there. The cutoff to join is October 1st, so you need to get on it. Basically, what you do is you'll send him an email that has your name, your preferences for stuff, your address. He'll match you up with somebody else. And then you guys uh, send off a virtual trick or treat. You get one in return and everybody has a lot of fun with it. I know it's a highlight for many of our listeners during the year. Also, this episode is going out on September 2nd, 2021, which means you only have a few more days to get in your flash fiction for our seven year anniversary show. That needs to be to us by September 6, 2021 at midnight. Word limit 1,000, creepy or scary type ghost story, something of that nature. We'll have three winners, and then we will also have some runner-ups, and we'll be sharing those stories on our anniversary show. You mail those to historyghostbump at gmail.com. We got a comment over on YouTube on our video for the Weinkauf Hotel from Kabuki Kitsune. I hope I said that right. There's a ghost story about the wine cough. Story goes that back in the 80s or 90s, while the building was empty, a man visiting Atlanta found himself looking for a place to stay one night. Not really knowing the area and not wanting to go too far from Atlanta proper, he wandered around the area before stumbling across the wine cough. The doors were open and the building was lit up brightly. Stepping inside, he approached the front desk and asked if they had any vacancies, and the clerk told him that they had one room left, as there was a convention in town, and if he wanted the room, it was his. He was shocked to be told that the room would only cost him a few dollars and wagered that the clerk just felt sorry for him. He did notice some curious effects to the building. For one, it was decked out like they were celebrating something. And everywhere he looked, there were references to 1946. He saw many young people in the lobby area, all dressed in clothing from the 40s, as well as one or two servicemen. He figured that this was an event of some sort and passed it off. Climbing to his room, he settled in for the night, only to be awakened by the smell of smoke in the wee hours of the morning. Rushing out of his room, he saw the flicker of fire creeping up the stairs and quickly rushed outside. Once he burst out onto the street and looked back, fully expecting to see the hotel ablaze, he saw the building had changed. It was now empty and somewhat run down, going through obvious renovations. Heading back inside, he found his belongings still in the room he had occupied. The man reportedly called the police about this and was told that this wasn't the first time such a thing had happened. At the time, the hotel had sat empty for a number of years, and there had been several cases of people apparently stepping back in time to the night of the fire. Since its renovations, the hauntings have apparently stopped. Wow. (laughs) I mean, I would love... Talk about a time slip. This, to me, is so unbelievable. I would love to see if they actually have these police reports. Exactly. If it's happened multiple times, because I'm like, that, to me, is wow. Wow. But you know what? I do remember listening to a campfire on Jim Harold's show where these people had gone into a bar that they could see from the road and they went. It was full of people. They had drinks. They hung out there for a while, danced and everything. And I can't remember exactly how it ended, but it seems to me like they left and went home. And then later on, they were passing it by or something and realized that it was an abandoned building and that there was no way that this had been a bar that was fully operating that evening or something. That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, it was one of the craziest stories. But clearly, this is something that can happen. Is it just time slip? I just can't imagine that it would be that long a period of a time slip that you could walk in, see all this activity, go up to your room and be sleeping and then go through the whole fire drama. Exactly. Until it like the dream is snapped or whatever. Usually you think, well, you walk in, You're in the lobby, you're looking around going, okay, well, must be some kind of a 1940s party and I'm ill-dressed for it. And then once you realize that or go up to your room, all of a sudden everything snaps into present time or something. Thank you so much for sharing. I want to thank you guys for joining us for this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode is brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Shelby Rickert for upping your support. We still have you in a garden crypt. You've been moving your way up. I think we added on a little extra stuff to that garden crypt. Now we're going to be adding a little bit extra as well. 
Thank you so much for supporting History Ghost Bump. We greatly appreciate it. And this episode was brought to you by HelloFresh. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. Kelly, you probably hate me because Why? all of these moments and oddities always have these fun things to pronounce. I'm going to love it when you pronounce his mother's name. Whoopi. Ankesenamiri. An- Go oh, I bet it's Ankh. A-N-K. Ankh. Mm-hmm. Go to Google Pronounce. Ankesenamiri. Uh, you know I'm going to take the time to go to Google Pronounce. Do you know how many letters that is that I'm going to have to type into the Google how to say? Actually, here's Humor what I'm, I'm going to copy and paste it. You know what? Hey, guess what? Copy and paste it. <laughs> or you can read the moment in oddity this week. <laughs> how to pronounce ancient Egyptian names. She says, a simple tip is that you emphasize the name of the god. Thanks, Scott Booker. <laughs> in which they were imbued. Imbued. <laughs> Imbued. They were imbued. <laughs> it's Halloween. It's a ghost. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? Kelly, you're about to talk about that they were imbued with the spirit of Osiris. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Love it. Kelly, do you think that this would help with the mosquitoes if we had some naked people running around with honey on their bodies outside here in Florida? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> you know you don't need any mosquito repellent. No, I just have you. Exactly. But keep your clothes on. I I certainly plan on it.